Hey guys, in this video, I'm going to be giving you a quick walkthrough of how to use all the basic features in the assembly workbench. So we're going to go through how to create an assembly and link parts into it, and then how to use all of the basic joins to make the, the assembly behave how you'd like. And then at the end of the video, we're going to put it all together and create the example on the FreeCAD wiki, along with a hacky way that we have right now to do animations. So. To start off with, we're going to create an assembly. And so when you create an assembly, you basically have a container that can hold either other assemblies or parts directly from like the part or part design workbench. Now you can create parts directly within an assembly and work on them within it. But the way that I would recommend working with assemblies is through inserting components from other files. This just means that when you want to make a change to a part, you don't need to open up your entire assembly and work on it within that. It can get a little bit laggy and overwhelming, especially if you have a larger assembly. It's just for organization's sake, a little bit nicer if you keep your parts within separate files. So. We go inside our assembly here, and when you hit insert component, you're going to see that we don't have any other files open here. You need to actually open the files that you want to import parts from. So I have a few here for this example. You can see we've got a few parts that we are going to use to demonstrate how all of these joints work. So now that we have our files open, when I hit insert component, you're going to see all of the parts within those files are now available to insert. So to start off with, I'm going to insert a few cubes. Now, you'll notice the first time that you insert a component, it's going to ask you if you want to ground it. We're going to hit yes. So what grounding a part does, it basically holds it in that location and everything else will be located relatively to it. You need at least one grounded part, otherwise the solver doesn't know how to place everything in space. So I'm just going to make that joint invisible. We don't need to see that that's the grounded one for now. But you'll see that these, this guy, I can't drag around. These ones are free to move. So now we're going to go over how to make joints, starting with the fixed joint. So when you create a joint, you first want to select a feature on the part that you want your other part to attach to. Now you'll notice that when you mouse over your part, it's going to create these little coordinate systems on whatever feature you have moused over. This is a connector, and it's what's going to determine how your parts orient to each other. Uh, notice which direction the Z is going. That is how your parts are going to align along the Z axis. So you can see they're going to match up. If you want to flip them, you just hit the flip button. You can rotate them, and if you use advanced offsets, you say you want to translate it along the X here. You can see the X of the coordinate system uh, is what we're sliding along. But for now, we are going to reset this back to zero and just glue these together. Now you can see this part can be moved around. This guy is now fixed. If you do move this object hold on yeah if you do move this object around manually and it gets placed somewhere else somehow when you solve your assembly here f5 that's what i have it set to you can see it's going to slap everything back into place according to how the joints constrain them so if attaching things directly on features like this freaks you out a little bit uh, if you're a little bit more experienced with FreeCAD, you'll know that sometimes when you alter a part, all of your features can get scrambled and it creates a mess. If you want your parts to be a bit more robust and you plan on changing them later, I would recommend just creating a coordinate system. If you've ever used Assembly 4, you can just make your own little coordinate system like this wherever you want an attachment point to be on your part, and then you don't have to worry about that. So. Some people say that's like a concern with this new workbench, but I think with that workaround, it's just, it's easier to use than assembly four. And if you want to use it like assembly four, you can. Anyway, that is a fixed joint. Oh, and one more thing I want to touch on here is 
if you end up with two parts joined that are not connected to a grounded part and you try to recompute, you'll see here. If you look in your report view, you're going to get this joint still touched after recompute. So if you see this and your assembly isn't working as you would expect it to, which can happen, then you know that you just have to connect your parts to a grounded part. All right, for these next few joints, I'm going to be using these two parts to demonstrate, and we're, we're going to fly through these pretty quickly, I think. So we've already got the handle on how to join two parts using a fixed. For the rest of them, you basically join them in the same way. So for Revolut, it's the same thing. You select your feature on one part, your feature on the other. Let's put the shaft in the hole a little bit, why not? And now this part will be constrained fully in space, but still be allowed to rotate along the z-axis. If we change this joint, we can either delete it and reselect cylindrical, or we can just go in the joint right here and change the type. What this does is now it allows it to move both in space along the z-axis and rotation-wise. Pretty straightforward. Um, the next one is slider, as you might expect. You can now slide along that z-axis, but not rotate. <laughs> Boom. Um, and of course, you can use your advanced offsets and change these any way you'd like, uh, if they're not quite in the right position that you want. All right, so before we hop into our last of the first group of joints here, the ball joint, we're going to go over these, uh, the distance, parallel and perpendicular, and angle joints, which are much looser constraints compared to the other, like the first set of joints. So I guess we will start off by making this surface and this surface parallel using a parallel joint. Boom. And you can see now it can move anywhere it just cannot rotate along like well here the x or y axis otherwise it would no longer be parallel so if we do rotate this a little bit off and recompute you can see boom back to parallel if we want this plane these two to be along the same plane we can constrain the distance between them to be zero and now you can see we have a part that sl can slide in the x and y along this plane uh, <clears throat> but has to remain has to remain coplanar here um, so what it can do now is it can still rotate though recompute it's fine if we constrain this angle here now we can create an interesting type of joint here where we are fully constrained in rotation and along this plane but we can still move fully in the x and y and if we add one more joint here actually something funny happens if we constrain these two planes and now we just have a slider so you can see if you need for some reason to have a uh, a more flexible joint than all of the others you can just add a few of these constraints if you wanted to have a few angles line up, like always be related to each other, you could create a variable and then set this angle to that. So you can do a lot more flexible things with these joints, but for the most part, you're gonna, like for a normal mechanical assembly, you're gonna get away with using just the normal first group of joints. And for the last joint here, I'm going to use these, this like very simple ball and socket model, to demonstrate how the ball joint works, which is basically as you would expect. This is now fully constrained in space along that connector that we selected, but it is free to rotate along all axes. Boom. One more thing to play around with is whenever you're creating a joint such as we'll do a slider joint you also have the ability to set limits on how far they can move so for example we're going to set a 
max of negative 10, which will be the bottom, and a min of 0. Now you can see we are fully constrained within this range. So another thing that might be very useful for constraining your assemblies properly. So for the other joints, you can do the same thing. You can set limits on angles for a revolu joint or angle and distance for a cylindrical. So now that we've gone over all of the basic joints, I'm going to use the first example from the FreeCAD wiki to show you an example of how they can all be used together. So we'll start off by creating an assembly, throwing all of our parts in it. Uh, we're going to need to ground a part. We'll ground the base here. Now we are going to revolute. slider revolute and cylindrical so well, there we go this is an example of what you might want to actually use this workbench for is uh, being able to actually visualize how your parts move together before printing out or getting parts manufactured, you can get a good idea of how things are going to actually work before putting in the resources to make something. So now, in FreeCAD 1.1, there is actually going to be a feature in the assembly workbench to animate this and do simulations. But for now, there is not that feature. So we have to do something a little bit janky to actually animate this. We're going to change this revolute joint to fixed because now we actually have a rotation number to change. We're just going to paste in this little Python script and look at that. She's moving. It's pretty nifty, huh? So that's it. There's the basic walkthrough. I didn't go over the rack and pinion, screw joint, belt and gear. These are a little bit more complicated to set up. Um, I believe there are some resources out there on how to use them, but in my opinion, you don't, for most basic assemblies, you're not really going to need to use these, even if you have something with gears. Um, if you know that they mesh, you know how it's going to interact. But it is pretty cool to actually get them working. Anyway, the other tools that I haven't really gone over is Exploded View. If you want to, for assembly's sake, show how all of the parts separate, you can use this to create basically a view where you place all your parts manually. You can also use this for drawing. This is a little bit more advanced though. And then Bill of Materials. You just, you can create a spreadsheet showing exactly how many of each part is required to build your assembly. Pretty straightforward. So with that, hopefully you have what it what you need to just go ahead and get started and create a relatively basic assembly and have a bit of a better handle on the quirks of the assembly workbench than I did when getting started. So this was my first video that I've posted on YouTube long form, so it was a little bit rough at times. Uh, I apologize. I would appreciate any feedback in the comments. And if there's anything that I missed or any tips you have for anybody else, feel free to leave them there as well. All right. Thanks.